Welcome to the Real Estate Asset Management Podcast brought to you by Break of Day Capital. The show focuses on educating syndicators and apartment owners on how to build systems and manage their properties more efficiently to become a best-in-class operator. 100% straight talk. Let's jump in. Hey, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Real Estate Asset Management Podcast. I'm your host, Gary Lipsky. This podcast is focused on educating operators, building better systems, and becoming a best-in-class operator. Be sure to join our Facebook group, Asset Management Mastery, where we have a great community of thousands of like-minded individuals sharing resources and best practices. Today on the podcast, we have Gino Barbaro. Gino, welcome to the show. Gary, got my last name right. You must be a former New Yorker, huh? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. (laughs) Uh, Gino has over $100 million in assets under management hosts one of the top real estate podcasts and has a thriving coaching business. Um, Do you know anything else I missed you want to tell about yourself? Father of six kids. We homeschool the kids ages 22 to seven. That trumps everything. I've got an amazing wife. And what I've learned, Gary, over the years in businesses, if your team sucks, then you suck. So I figured it out when I got married. I won that one, thankfully. Had a restaurant for 20 years, one restaurant for 20 years. And it was just me, my brother, mom, and dad. And you can't run a business that way. You can, but you're going to be a single operator, which is nothing wrong with that until you realize that life is more than just a job. I wanted to create an amazing entrepreneurial business. That's what my dream was since I got out of college. It took me a long time to figure it out, but at least I figured it out. 2013, we buy our first deal, me and Jake, 25 units, six years later. And it's just us, no syndication, you know, for the first thousand units in five or six years, 1500 units. What the hell happened? I didn't get any smarter. I just started figuring out business and we're not born with business skills. We're not born with sales skills. We're not born with any skills. We need to learn. You either pay to play or you seek to serve, right? You either learn in the classroom or you learn in the street and learning on the street costs a lot more in the long run. So for me, it really learned, I learned from scaling up coaching. I learned from traction coaching. I learned through other mentors, but how does a guy with one restaurant several years later, get 1500 units in five years. It's obviously teamwork. It's people, systems, and culture. And hopefully we can dive into that on this podcast. Yeah, I love it. Absolutely. Because yeah, you can't, you can't do everything yourself. Real estate is, is such a team sport and you can really get to scale quickly mm-hmm. by working with others, by having, having great people, as, as you said. So you know, when, did, when did you start thinking about building a business? Gary, let me address what you just said. And I think it's true. I, I just finished reading David Goggins' book. I mean, for anybody out there, you know, it can't hurt you. Awesome book. What I love about his book was you had to get mentally tough. And, and sometimes you hear the slogan, everyone out there, oh, well, delegate what you don't like to do. Well, yeah, after, after you've done it for so many years and you've sucked it and you've swallowed crap, that's what the restaurant taught me. I swallowed crap and I did a lot of things that I did not like doing. And I hated doing a lot of things and I worked really hard and I suffered through it and I built that mindset. Whereas now somebody says, oh, you got a full day, six hours. Of I'm like, that's a piece of cake compared to what I had to do. So don't go out there and say to yourself when you're starting out in your business, I'm not going to do what I don't like to do. In Goggins' book, and I think this is truly important to teach our children, we need to do what we don't like to do. So we know the pain and the mental anguish that comes with it. Get good at it. If you don't get good at it, ultimately, you will, you will delegate that. For my problem at the restaurant, I held on for so many years doing menial tasks, washing dishes and doing all that kind of stuff when obviously I should have delegated that sooner. And that's one of the problems that I didn't do out there. So, I mean, to build a, I guess to me, to, to build a world-class organization, I, I've got a business frame. Let's talk about a real quick business frame. I think you need a purpose statement, everybody. Why are you in business? I mean, at Jake and Gino, when we first started education, I retired from the restaurant in March of 2016. I moved down to Florida. I'm like, what the hell do I do down here? Dude, I've been on the beach after two days. I'm like freaking bored out of my mind. Jake's running the property management. I'm down here. So I started the Jake and Gino. We started writing books and, and really scaling up. The purpose statement for Jake and Gino, it took me a long time. I got into a podcast with a guy named Carmine Gallo. He's written those presentation books of Steve Jobs. He says, what do you do, Gino? I I couldn't answer the question. I I write write books. I do podcasts. I ripped it down to a single statement, everybody. If Google can do it, if Gino can do it, you need to do it. Jake and Gino, we create multifamily entrepreneurs. That's what our education company does. That's what we strive to do. At the Ram Property Management aspect of it, we want to be the Chick-fil-A of apartments. Now, what does that mean? When you go into a Chick-fil-A, prompt, courteous, clean, great service. 
It's our pleasure. That's what we want to do in the C space. You need to have your purpose statement and your catalyzing statement. Gary, the next thing, core values. Didn't know what the hell a core value was when I was in the restaurant business. Core values are super important. Now, if you have one operation or two stores, you maybe don't need one. But if you're going to get into multifamily and you start scaling up, find out what your core values are. Spent a couple hundred grand on coaching to figure them out. I have five. People first, make it happen. Unwavering ethics, extreme ownership, and growth mindset. Very important for you to flush those out. It took us a long time. Those are all unique to everybody out there. They're not bullet points. They're not a marketing point. They are people first. Well, if I need to get on a podcast, I'm going to get on a podcast. If I need to ship one of my books, I'm going to do that, right? It's all about making it happen. And for people first, we need to put our investors first. We need to put our education students first. We need to put our residents. They're not tenants, they're residents and they're apartment homes. They're not units. This is where people live. This is where people make their memories. If you can make it personal and you can have your team understand that it's a personal thing, everything changes. So core values are crucial. And I was on a podcast with Karen Harold about month or two ago, Google Cameron Harold, everybody, he has this book called Vivid Vision. I actually spent hours writing it. It's pretty painful to do it, to be completely honest with you. But I wrote out the Vivid Vision for Jake and Gino. We have one for Rand Property Management. We have one for our Rand Development and one for a 100-year brand as well. What is your Vivid Vision for what you want your company to be three or four years into the future? It's really important to know. And these may be crazy goals. You may say to yourself, I'm never going to get 8 million downloads on my podcast. But you know what? You put it out there and you know where you're going. And through that, you work through your core values to get that. I think the next thing, Gary, on the business frame, your business strategy. Who are you? What are you going to do? And how are you going to do it? So business strategy. Who are you? We're Jake and Gino. What do we do? We're multifamily educators, entrepreneurs. How are we going to do it? Through our mentorship through our MM4 that we're having, through our live events, through writing books. That's how we're going to do it. Then obviously underneath that, we need short-term goals and long-term goals. So we can get into that as well as far as our cadence of accountability. But let me repeat that for everybody once again. Our purpose statement, then our overarching catalyzing statement, then the core values, then your business strategy, then your short-term and long-term goals. Now, I gave that to you on a silver platter, everybody. Go back and listen to that because that is freaking 10 years worth of pain, which I wish I'd known that before. Before you invest into a real estate deal, I don't want to hear about deal flow and all this. You need to figure out why you're doing it, what your buy right strategy is, what your criteria is, and what kind of business you're building. Because it's not just one little building here because you're going to buy one deal, then another deal. And before you know it, you have 100 units and you're running around a chicken without a head. And you're like, how do I do this? It's a business, everybody. You need to be an asset manager, and a property manager. Those are two different distinct uh, duties. When Jake and I started buying deals, we we're buying deals ourselves and we we're property managing. The biggest mistake I made was property management's here, asset management's here. They've got to work in conjunction, but still at the same time, when you're doing both of those duties, sometimes you get a little sloppy. So think of yourself as the asset manager, ultimately, who's overlooking the property manager. And you have to work, work, both work really well together. Well, that was a ton of great information. That was that was 10 minutes of an MBA for someone, you know? I paid a lot of money for that MBA. Let me tell you something. And honestly, learning every day, we just had a call with our business partner on Monday. It just gives you clarity. And when you're clear about what your goals are and you, you're clear about what your core values are, I know who to hire. I know who to fire. I can't blame Gary for busting the table wrong because I didn't tell Gary how to bust that table. That was the problem with the restaurant. I didn't have a core value on how to hire somebody or your vendors, the people you're working with. If you don't have core values and you can't measure up against something, you just don't have any kind of system to do that. And that was a real struggle for me. It was very hard. Systems aren't complex, everybody. Systems are very simple. You pick up a phone, everybody be, better be answering that phone the same damn way. If someone walks into an office, everybody better be greeted the same way. You send out an email, there should be templated emails, everything that's replicatable. And it doesn't have to happen all at once. It's a complete process. Don't be overwhelmed by it. Every month, you're putting on something new. And you know, let's jump into that cadence of accountability. For us to build a great world-class organization, you need communication. And you need to have some type of rhythm with your team members. If you're working with property management, I don't know, maybe every week, maybe overwhelming for a third-party property manager. But I mean, what's a 10-minute call? 
on week two saying, Hey, you know, Gary, why do we have $10,000 in delinquencies this week? I'd rather catch it on the front end to be proactive. You need to be proactive in life, not to bury your head in the, you know, the head in the sand. And what we like to do is we like to have what we call level 10 meetings. So Jake and Gino, I have my executive assistant. I have my uh, operations manager. I have my sales team. I have a, I have a vendor uh, person as well. I have my brother who's a student success specialist. I have L10 level 10 meetings with each one of them about 30 minutes a week. We have our priorities laid out, our yearly priorities. Then every quarter we meet at the end of the quarter to go over the following next quarter's priorities. Next quarter's, this quarter's priorities right now, we're building a shopping cart for Jake and Gino on the website. A priority is anything that's eight hours or longer. A task is things that lead up to that priority. What Jake and I used to do, you're probably one of them, we'd shotgun, machine gun our, our employees and be like, I mean, we could accomplish a lot, but you know, at the same time, you can't overwhelm everybody. So those quarterly priorities are truly important. Pick three or four that are really going to move the needle. For us, it's all about getting better at marketing. For us, it's all about getting better at public speaking. For us, it's all about getting that shopping cart on and launching books. So those are our priorities laid out. And from there, you break them down into tasks and you put them on your L10, level 10 doc every week you're meeting going through the quarterly priorities. And then, you know, you get that itching going, well, I got this great idea. That shiny object goes into what we call the parking lot for next quarter. And, you know, as life has it, I don't know if everybody remembers the pandemic, when the pandemic hit back in March, we had our priorities laid out, but what happened? You couldn't go into an apartment. So virtual leasing came up and bubbled up. So that overtook every other priority. So you need to be flexible, but at the same time, you need to have a plan. I never had priorities or quarterly meetings at the restaurant. I ran it just like a mom and pop shop. Those quarterly priorities are important. We also have what we call our um, daily huddles in the morning. We get together 845 every morning with our Jake and Gino team members for 15 minutes. Yesterday's wins, today's goals, and any sucks or challenges. The whole team is on there. You have to, I mean, Cameron Held wrote, wrote another book about meetings suck. You have to have really great meetings with, with you know, priorities. And I remember hiring uh, Mackenzie on about six months ago. She came on the team and she jumped on our, our weekly huddle. We have a weekly huddle every Monday, about 45 minutes for the entire organization. Those were all the heads of the leaders on there. After the call, she, she gives me a call on the cell phone. She's like, and I've been working in corporate eight or nine years because I've never been on a meeting where we've accomplished so much. Usually they're just all over the place. Well, that's what you want. You want to have, you're the leader, get on the call, make sure you discuss. We go over our Rockefeller habits every, every Monday. We go over our key performance indicators, our metrics. We get into metrics real quick, but if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. And that's what systems helps you and allows you to do for us. That's important. Uh, we also have with, the property management, something we call a weekly pulse. Every Friday, our property managers send out this report and the report's important. I can share it with you and, and anybody on the podcast if they like it. It talks about, you know, vacant unrented, vacant rented, delinquencies, how many evictions are going on, uh, you know, weekly, uh, monthly income going on there, guest cards versus applications, how many, you know, all that information on a weekly document, because you see it every week, and you like to see the numbers trend. And if anything goes off skew, you can catch it on things. It's always about being proactive. And when you have one or two properties, weekly pulses may not be that important, but always think with the end in mind, you're not going to stick with one or two. You're going to stick with the business. So start earlier. And I think another document that we love to utilize is something we call a property log. We had never done this earlier on, but as we started growing, when you've got 15 different assets, create a property log for each individual property. When was the last time you power washed the building? When was the last time you had the gutters cleaned? Who are all the vendors, pest control, utility? How old is the building? All this information for each individual property. So you know what's going on with your maintenance. You know what's going on with the property. And when you're ready to sell the property, bam, all the information's there, or you have to refi the property, whatever, it's there, it's systemized. These little things need to happen as you're growing. Because what happened, we've, we just pulled the property logs over the last six months, but it took us an inordinate amount of time and probably hundreds of hours wasted because we didn't have this stuff documented. So start out when you're small. Don't think of yourself as small. Think of yourself as an entrepreneur growing into the opportunity. I love it. I love it. We do a lot of the same things and, and um, it, it just, it, it just makes your life so much simpler when, when you're organized and everyone's on the same page. And, you know, when, earlier you talked about core values and purpose statement. It just, it allows you to hire the right people, yes. maybe let go of the, of people that aren't working out. And it just provides a roadmap and all these things. It, it leads to success. Mm -hmm. And 
you certainly you can be successful if you don't do all these things, but man, the, the, the percentage, the likelihood of success, if you follow these things, it goes through the roof. So, and obviously you've been super successful. So great, great stuff. I just want to, I, I want to, I actually say sorry to everybody for going real fast, but I know it's short time. It's condensed. I'm super excited about talking about this stuff because it's led to an amazing life for me. I don't want you guys to make the same mistakes that I did. There's a lot of mistakes that I made that I wish I had made. Maybe it's made me the person that I am today, but you know, from one New Yorker to another New Yorker, you know how we are. We like to move things, but sometimes take a step back, reflect and see where you want to go. And if you want to have one or two or three properties, there's nothing wrong with that. You may not need all the systems, but don't shortchange yourself. You know, Gabe Goggins said in that book, it really sticks with me. We really limit ourselves. We're all made for greatness. And we all look around and we look at other people and we say, maybe we should be doing that. We're all made for greatness. Just understand where your greatness lies and what you want to accomplish. And then, you know, ultimately, as you start getting better, you don't have to do all those menial tasks. That's why you start hiring employees and start scaling up. In the beginning, you're going to be one type of person, the I'm a mentality. I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. But by the time you have 100 or 200 or 300 units, you can't be doing that anymore. And that's the hardest thing with being an entrepreneur is making that first real hire. You can delegate out bookkeeping. You can delegate out you know, editing podcasts or whatever. But once you get that first butt in the seat, and for me, it was Josh, who was a sales guy. And that, was my, that wasn't my skill set. I couldn't sell my own education. I got him on everything changed. So don't be afraid. That is the hardest thing you're going to do as an entrepreneur. But I will guarantee you, if you're hiring somebody for a year, and you've got to pay that person even $100,000 a year, put them on a three month trial. It's not as scary when you rip down three months out of 100 grand. What is that? 10, 25 or $30,000 that you're going to have to think about after three months, you reassess, I will guarantee you, you will see a ton of value in that three months and it'll continue to go on. But don't be afraid. We're all in the same boat. And I will guarantee you, once you make that first hire, it starts to become addictive. You're like, okay, what else can I get? What else can I do? And then you start seeing after the pain where your value lies and how you can continue to scale your operations. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So I'm, I'm excited to be going to my first uh, multifamily mastery uh, next week. This mm. podcast will air afterwards. But um, what else is coming down the pipeline for, for people? I just shared the book with you. We just wrote a children's book. The cannolis exploded. Now what? And for us, it's it's a, it's a children's book between seven and 10 year olds. And I always want parents to have that conversation with their kids because my other catalyzing statement is people with financial intelligence can change the world for the better. We don't have, in my estimation, all the problems in this country. They stem from people being financially unintelligent. They're, they're, they're over leveraged that instant gratification comes about. If you can't afford the damn couch, don't buy the damn couch. But no one's telling them to do that. People are telling them to stay out of debt, but why are you staying out of debt? There's other reasons. You, you save money to buy an asset. Nobody's talking about that. They're saving for retirement. Why are you saving for retirement? I was taught that years and years ago. My first deal that I bought back in 2013 with a 25 unit little crack den, I still own that property. We're netting nine grand a month today after I refat out all my money. I only own 30% of it. So I'm only making three grand a month. Guess what? My first daughter went through college four years from that property. My second son is up. He's going through that. The rest of my kids are going to go through college from that one crappy property. Do I need a 529? No, I need to continue to buy assets. And the same thing with your retirement. Don't worry about retiring. That's a scarcity mindset. You're saving for something, save to buy assets. And this book basically talks about the responsible rhino, the creative caterpillar, and the pity party pig. Which one of them do you want to be? The, the, uh, the bakery blows up, pity party pig goes out and buys lottery tickets. He goes out and buys a TV and cars and crap. Responsible Rhino buckles down, goes and gets a job. The creative caterpillar is the entrepreneur. So there's a little bit of all of us in there. And we don't teach our kids that we have choices. We have responsibility. Not making a decision is making a decision. So we did it in a colorful way. We've got some coloring, coloring pictures in here. And that's one of my passions is really to start teaching kids and young adults that, hey, you have the option. You're not teaching this stuff in school. That's why it's incumbent upon us as entrepreneurs. We're the ones who are going to change the world, not the government, not corporate. Entrepreneurs are going to change the world. And I think that's why we have a responsibility to teach this stuff. Absolutely. So where can people find that book? Is it on your website, Amazon? Where? You just go to Amazon. You go to Amazon.com. The author is my wife, Julia Barbara, or you can go to jakeandgino.com forward slash books, and you'll see all of our books on there. We've got five other books on top of that. You can click on that one and purchase that one as well. Awesome. I love it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buy a couple for my nieces and nephews. 
You bet. When you come to the event, get your couple. We're going to have a few hundred there. So make sure when you get there, I want to sign a book for you, bro. I right, appreciate it. That'd be awesome. Well, tons of great information. And this is, uh, you know, under 30 minutes. But like I said earlier, this is, this is someone's MBA. If you listen to this to, again and again, there's so much great stuff in there. I, I'm super appreciative uh, for coming on and, and sharing your, your wisdom about growing your business. Um, anyone could take this. It, you don't need to be the smartest person in the room, um, but it, it's just very easy, actionable steps that anyone can do to be successful. Mm -hmm. Love that. I want to thank you for having me on. And listen, I'll see you in a few days. And everybody yeah. out there, remember, people of financial intelligence, we can change the world for the better. Remember that. Absolutely. Where can listeners find out a little bit more about you? Oh, just go to jakeandjeter.com. If they want to email me for a copy, I've got a copy. I think Creative Cash is going to be, uh, you're seeing what's going on with the banks. Banks are pulling back. We've been thinking about this. Our coach Bill Hammer wrote the book. If you want a PDF copy, just email me, gino at jakeandjeter.com, and I'll send you a PDF copy of it. Awesome. Thanks so much. To all of our listeners out there, thanks for listening. And if you like this episode, please head over to iTunes and mm -hmm. Stitcher and like, subscribe, and review this podcast so we can help grow our audience. And if you'd like to learn more about what we do at breakofdaycapital.com, head over to our website, sign up for our newsletter, and we'll talk to you next week. Thanks so much. Thanks, Gary.